particularly cities in California and the United States, where we are the uh, largest consumers of resources in the world on a per capita basis. This is Peak Moment. We are living at a peak of human innovation, information, wealth, and health. But we're also at a peak of population and consumption, with rising temperatures and declining resources fueled by cheap oil and gas. Peak Moment Television, bringing you examples of positive responses to energy decline and climate change through local community action. Hi, welcome to Peak Moment. I'm Jenea Donaldson. I'm here in the city of San Francisco with people who are involved with the city of San Francisco on energy and climate. I'm with Cal Broomhead, who's the manager of the energy and climate programs, and Melissa Capria, who's the climate action coordinator with the city and county mm -hmm. of San Francisco. You guys are already sort of ahead of a lot of cities on the curve of paying attention to peak oil and climate change. So I want to start with a question of why? What reasons do you have for doing something about this in your city? Yeah. Well, cities have a lot of reasons for, for doing something. And San Francisco, when you think about peak oil and climate change, you have to think of a city that's surrounded on three sides by water. Mm -hmm. So uh, climate change is going to have a big impact yes. on the city and county of San Francisco as a government. But generally, uh, cities now represent over, we have over 50% of the population of the world yes. is living in cities. Cities consume 75% of the world's resources, particularly cities in California and the United States, where we are the uh, largest consumers of resources in the world on a per capita basis. So cities certainly have a large responsibility. But more importantly, cities suffer a lot of the impacts the, of the things that are causing climate change and mm. things that are causing mm. uh, uh, the issues around peak oil. Primarily, you've got local air quality issues. Yes. Every yes. local government in the nation yes. pretty much has a local air quality issue. Um, you have economic development that is a problem that everybody is concerned about. We continue to pour lots of money into repairing pollution. Uh, and then there are the impacts uh, of, of uh, the potential imp negative impacts of peak oil and climate. Here in San Francisco, as I mentioned, we're very concerned about what's going to happen to Ocean Beach. We're already experiencing erosion at Ocean Beach. Um, along, along your west side? Along really? the western shore. <laughs> from from climate change? That's been, well, we don't know, don't know exactly it's what it's from. Mm -hmm. They tell us that we've had a five inch rise in the ocean. We've got, we certainly have things or conditions are changing out at the beach. Wow. Um, our airport, if any of you have flown into San Francisco International, you know it's practically on the water. Yes, uh, you yes. know, Treasure Island, the new development that's supposed to be the jewel of the bay, it's flat out there on the water. Our financial district is actually all reclaimed uh, yes, bay, formerly right, bay, right. and was filled in after the 06 earthquake and built upon over the many years. And uh, you know, all of these areas are at risk. And more importantly, uh, when it comes to uh, peak oil issues, you're thinking about prices going up and sure. things becoming more scarce. Sure. And in addition to, to climate being a threat to low-income uh, people in San Francisco, mm -hmm. so is peak oil. Well, we're looking at an increased food food cost because it all has to get trucked into the city sure. here. Well, I've, I've been told that for, every, for uh, every unit of energy that actually goes into your mouth, it takes 12 units of I've energy to produce that food and get it to your mouth. And most of those calories or that energy is fossil fuel. Is fossil fuel. Right. And it, so if the price of that goes up, then it means it's going to have a huge impact on the price of food. So we're looking at some impacts that are going to hit the pocketbooks of our, of our population. We already have a homeless problem in the city that doesn't mm -hmm. seem to want to go away. Uh, it could get worse. We have a danger to our, to our infrastructure. Our sewage treatment plant is down by the bay. And what would happen to just a one foot sea level rise? Well, they've told us what would happen. It would back up the seawater into the discharge pipes and into the discharge, uh, the withholding or the holding tank system. Uh, it's our whole stormwater management process that the city has. So we're just starting to look at what the impact side of these things are, and they are serious. What, what are the projections just for I mean, the sea level rise? I mean, we don't know entirely how quickly it's going to happen, the, but it is happening. The yes. latest so. study that the state put out shows um, in California by the end of the century um, with a high emissions scenario about three feet rise. Three feet. Um, there, 
the thing about those models that are used to come up with that kind of projection is they're not really good at looking at the physics of the disintegration of ice sheets. So oh. there's kind of new evidence coming out that might suggest something even greater than that. And again, I want to point out with, those, with that range, there, there's actually a range. It's uh, somewhere around six inches to three feet. And that's entirely dependent on what our response is globally, meaning our, our, human response. our human response, how much uh, emissions we continue to emit. So there is an empowering piece of this, which is, you know, that may not be ine inevitable if we get we serious, some, you know, and in the next 10 years start to really look at this stuff uh -huh. and change, you know, our behavior, then we, we can, you know, forestall that. Well, and Al Gore was say changing it now. Mm -hmm. changing, changing it now. now. Yeah. Not, and, and not, not wait for 10 years. Well, I mean, in the next Within 10 the years. Ten years. years. Yes. Yeah. But Melissa's made a, a point uh, to me in our day-to-day -day contact that we're really talking about a 30-year time lag. Things that we do today time lag. Are, are going uh -huh. to affect uh -huh. what's going on 30 years from now. So the more we can do today will improve the picture 30 years from now. I've, mm -hmm. I've got young children, so I'm, this is something I'm, clearly I'm very uh, concerned about. And when you think about local governments, uh, typically local governments make decisions that last for decades. Yes. yes. And uh, I've heard one gentleman really talk about it in terms of thinking about a century. That you, people, people who are on the city council and in local government today, are making decisions that are going to have set the stage and, and provide the environment of local governments 100 years from now. And so things that we don't deal with now, we're saddling the, the local government, right. our representatives right. who are sitting in the same chairs, hopefully, in the same place, but they'll be wrestling with those 100 years from today. So we have a responsibility today to think about what that To think for is. the future mm -hmm. right. here. Because what, we're, we're living based on the prosperity of what was set up that's true. 100 years ago. That's true. And I would venture to say probably not just 100 years, but even 50 with the accelerated population and accelerated changes in our world, that what, what might have been 100 years 100 years ago, maybe within 50 or 25 sure, years now. Sure. So what can a city do? Well, one of the first things that this response is, of course, an organic uh, aspect to it. You have support from the population, people in, uh, asking their electric representatives how they're going to deal with certain situations. We've had an electric reliability problem here in San Francisco. We have two power plants in the southeast part of the city that were uh, polluting and mm. uh, people were very up, some people were very upset about that. Businesses were very concerned about the reliability issue. Uh, we had, a, we have an a group of people in the, in the environmental movement in San Francisco who for many years have been trying to get the city to think about creating a sustainability plan. Mm -hmm. So we had already created a sustainability plan. We had already created a plan, an electricity uh, resource plan that looked at reliability of the grid and how to shut down one or both of the power plants and do it with a cleaner uh, approach uh -huh. rather than building a big new power plant. So we had some of that uh, foundation was already laid, but uh, to get our plan going, our climate plan going, mm -hmm. is that uh, we turned and got some help from the International Council of Local Environmental Initiatives, which is based in Toronto, and they've been helping local governments all over the world, and uh, hundreds here in, San Francisco, mm -hmm. here in uh, the United States, to develop their plans. And, and essentially, it's gathering the data, and uh, actually, Melissa, you should tell more about detail about that. Sure, yeah. Basically, what, this is our climate action plan that the city and county of San Francisco has put together. And essentially, you know, it's not the same as a plan you might put together for peak oil, but it's, it's very similar. The, the peak oil solutions and the climate solutions are, are very similar. Essentially, we want to get away from fossil fuels and uh -huh. move to uh -huh. renewable energy and, um, you know, less dependence on single occupancy vehicles, better transit systems. So what we did was in 2004, we put out a climate action plan mm -hmm. that both does an inventory of what our greenhouse gas emissions are. For the, the city? For the, just, for the municipal operations and for the community as I whole. I see. So it wasn't just what the city vehicles and fire trucks and right. police That's are right. using, but your whole population? That's right. right. 
Woo. So, okay. and what that, the way you do that, well, the way any city would do that is by collecting end use data on kilowatt hours of electricity used mm -hmm. in the residential sector, in the commercial sector, in the industrial sector, uh, natural gas usage in those sectors, mm -hmm. uh, information on VMT, uh, that's vehicle miles traveled, to determine what your emissions from transportation are. And there's some standardized it's, methods. So you have stuff both with people who live in the city and go elsewhere and people who work in the city coming from elsewhere. I mean, there's that's right. Be blurry yeah, here. it's complicated. I'll Transportation gets complicated, and that's why Cal had mentioned ICLE, the organization that we worked with. They run a program called Cities for Climate Protection that uh -huh. basically helps you with doing a the data collection process and conducting an inventory, and then putting together a plan to address. Um, what those emissions are. And kind of the first step in the plan after you do the inventory and you know where your emissions are is to set a reduction target. Uh -huh. So what San Francisco did is in 2002, before we actually had our plan, our board of supervisors established a greenhouse gas reduction target of nine, or, uh, sorry, 20 percent below 1990 emissions by 2012. All right. And that's, so we're, we're, that was what? That, in 02. That's right. So four years ago, mm -hmm. we're in 06 now, they're looking at where are you going to be four years from, no, six, six years, years from now. Right, right. And to give you a context of how aggressive that target is, Kyoto Protocol for the U.S. would have been a 7% reduction below 1990 levels. AB 32, the, the big climate bill that the state of California just passed, is um, to reach 1990 levels by, by uh, 2020. So, so that's, yours is much more aggressive. That's right. And, and you'll find that cities all over the country are doing this kind of thing. There's, a, there's something called the U.S. Mayor's Climate yes. Protection Agreement, yes. where hundreds, I think somewhere around 300 mayors have committed to meeting the Kyoto Protocol, and that's for their whole community. And the reason cities are doing this is because cities do have a lot of a power to address yes. Yes. the sources of greenhouse gases. Our, the head of our department, Jared Blumenfeld, always likes to say, "Is really there's no international smokestacks. You know, it's it's in it's cities. Local. It's local. Yeah. It's where it's where mm -hmm. you are. Where, and uh, although the effects are are, that are global, much yeah. bigger. Yes. So it's a classic example of act locally, uh, think globally. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So what? Um, so I want to go back for just a second. Your policy, your city mm -hmm. said, okay, let's do something here about climate change. Right. What else? So they can do a study. They can do a plan. Then what? What does your plan say? I mean, what does the plan say well, to the, do? Well, the I mean, study showed that our, our uh, greenhouse gas emissions are about half and half from transportation and from buildings. Mm -hmm. So the mm -hmm. natural gas that people use in their, for their heating, uh, the electricity they use in their homes, uh, business, what businesses use, is about equal to what the transportation uh -huh. element uh -huh. of, of our greenhouse gas emissions are. So based on that, we looked at, so what's, what do we think we can reasonably achieve in order to get our, it comes in San Francisco, it's two and a half million tons of, of annual uh, reduction. How are we going to get our two and a half million tons? Where are we going to get it from? So we're looking at 51% of it coming from the combination of energy efficiency and renewable energy. Okay. Most Efficiency of that attracting and renewables. Addressing mm -hmm. uh, buildings. Okay. And we made the assumption that it's actually going to be more difficult to get to the transportation. You know, piece of I it. think you're right on that <laughs> one. That's, that's kind of, when I when I talk with peak oil folks, it's like it's easy to think about more efficient bulbs and other things which yeah. you'll talk to us about, but transportation has got to be the thorny one for us. So even though transportation represents about half, we put 37 percent into transportation mm -hmm. reduction. The other 12 percent are going to come from recycling and waste, solid waste management. Oh. Um, our city currently is diverting 68% of the waste from the community wide in, uh, from the landfill. It's being recycled, reused. Okay. And uh, fortunately, they've just done a, recently done a study that showed that 40% of what is left is a green waste. It's a lot of food organic. waste, organic so. material. And we already have a composting program. So by, by going another, getting that, if we can get that other 40%, we can get a long way towards um, 75, 80% so of our So just for a waste. second here, looking in this plan, because I'm really curious, 
to reduce the, the, en the energy through the buildings, what kinds of measures are you taking to, do, to, increase in, to do that? Well, there, the local governments have four fundamental tools. You can inform and educate the public and hope people will just go out and do things. So we're good very simply, because that's that. conservation, turning your lights off when you leave the room, right. buying efficient light bulbs, uh, buying Energy Star products, you know, just being a smart consumer and being okay. aware of the fact that when you flip a switch, it's actually it's having an impact effects. on, yeah. Okay. Right. And using so you can water. Educate. And mm -hmm. using water also is also yeah. another important and thing. Yeah, conserving it, water. You have to pump water to get it into the faucet oh, and then right. afterwards you have to, you you have to that's right. pump it and treat it afterwards. So there's okay. a lot of energy in the water wastewater cycle. Uh -huh. um, the second thing that local governments try to do is provide technical assistance. Mm -hmm. Somebody wants to do the right thing, they have some questions, you try to provide them answers. Yeah, maybe they know they have to change a light bulb but they're not sure what light bulb they should change to. Where to get or it. Right. Know, that sort of thing. Good and uh, we actually have funding right now to help businesses and multifamily building owners get the technical assistance they great, need. We can great. send out an engineer who will actually go through the building mm -hmm. and take a look and give them an assessment. Uh, the third is incentives. And whether it's through a tax break of some kind or a, uh, a, little, a you know, little bit of money off on a fee, um, or making things, expediting uh, permit processes. Uh, there are a lot of little tricks that local governments can use to provide incentives. Currently in our group, we've received uh, money f through, the, uh, through the state and our local utility to actually provide cash to multifamily building owners and to small businesses that are doing the right thing. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, now, is that cash tied to, it needs to be used for efficiencies? For oh yes, absolutely. It's I mean, very, so they it's, so they replace them all with compact fluorescents or whatever mm -hmm. it is. Exactly. I see. That's right. Okay. Highly specified. Uh -huh. uh, okay. And the uh, we also have a green business program so that we certify businesses that have done a number of these things in uh, solid waste management, helping their employees with uh, commuter check benefits uh, so that they'll take public transit. Uh, they're recycling, they're being energy efficient to a certain level, they can get a green business certification and then they can advertise themselves as a green business. And this so there's status in, in so that they control right. their own status. Right. So that's another incentive that yeah. local governments can offer. And there are a whole number of these kinds of things. And finally, local governments can pass laws. So you can pass a law and we have a law that says at the time of sale of a home, or a, a residential unit in the city, it has to meet a very minimum energy standard. Uh -huh. And it, it's, it's been on the books for 20 years now. The utility of it has dropped off considerably, and we're going to be doing an upgrade of that to and what, make what it is, what is the Just give me a sense of what requirements. Attic insulation, uh -huh. water heater blanket, uh -huh. uh, you know, low flow shower head, a, low, a, a, a water efficient toilet, some very I basic, see. I see. basic things are required. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So, so you've got carrots and you've got some sticks. And we got some sticks. Sometimes That's right. as well. I would imagine, I gotta say that when we, we crossed, the, crossed the Bay Bridge to come into the city um, this weekend and saw, I saw all the lights on in the big financial district and I remember how after the bridge, after we had the, the earthquake, the Loma Prieta earthquake, a lot, or, or we, I'm trying, that might have been the time, there was a lot less electricity usage and I looked at this and I thought, why do we have all the lights on at midnight, you know? We're not doing it for security on the 85th floor. Right. So, yeah, well, it well, takes people asking those kinds of questions, right. too. You know, we, we need our whole community to get involved and ask uh -huh. those kinds of questions right. and point out these things that maybe seem obvious, mm -hmm. but, you know, it helps to have a very engaged uh, public, you know, who's willing to come to elected officials and come to the city and Is say, you know, why are you doing this? It leads right. me to right. a thought. I would think that there are some things the city could do by example that what mm -hmm. you do is, is out of leadership. Sure. So that if your whole fleet of cars were, for example, all electric, pretend. That's a good well, example. You know. That's a good example, and the city has right. a policy that uh, no standard vehicles shall be purchased. All vehicles purchased for the city and county must be an alternative fuel mm -hmm. of some sort, and there's a whole range of them that they can pick from. If they can't find one, you know, if they can't find a fire truck that has the right can meet uh, the right specification. I mean, we've got some very steep hills in San Francisco, and it yes. needs to be able to climb those steep hills. And um, 
So if it can't meet the specifications, then they can get a waiver for it. Right. But we now have, an, aside from our bus fleet, we have over 1,000 alternative fuel vehicles in mm -hmm. the city. Mm -hmm. Using what, I'm going to ask? Uh, hybrid diesels. We right. have just got a bunch of hybrid natural gas. Compressed natural mm -hmm. gas, mm -hmm. propane, mm -hmm. uh, hybrid uh, uh, gasoline, electric. Uh, we've got some electric vehicles, mm -hmm. a bunch of electric vehicles. In fact, you know, a good portion of our muni bus fleet is, you know, the wires overhead, Yes, yes. you know, is, is electric, right. so. And they just um, bought a bunch of uh, hybrid diesel buses. Mm -hmm. So we're still using fossil fuels, but less. That's right. I mean, in, in the picture yeah, the, here. Yeah, the plan is, I mean, you're not going to overnight be able to switch, right, but, right. Um, you know, we are looking at biodiesel. For instance, Cal mentioned the fire trucks. We actually have some pretty active firefighters who, for a number of reasons, one of them being climate change, but another being, you know, when those fire trucks sit in idle in a firehouse, there's a lot of particulate matter and pollutants that are just bad for the health of the firefighters. Okay. So they've started to look to biodiesel for the fire trucks for, you know, there's it has these dual, dual benefits. Yes. So, right. so and, there, and that's important to note too, you know, almost virtually everything you can do to uh, address climate change and peak oil has co-benefits to it. Yes. All the energy saving stuff saves money, you know, the, the fuel stuff saves criteria, air pollutants. Um, the I think we should also talk again more about recycling because I don't think we explained yeah. exactly so, how that... I wanna, how does that do some saving? Thank sure. you for that. I yeah. want to get back to that. How does recycling okay. save Pollutants and energy. Yeah, yeah, well, so you, somebody, either Cal, I think you mentioned earlier about food and the embedded energy and food. Right. And, you know, those aren't direct emissions in our, in our city. Um, but s similar with recycling, when you recycle an aluminum can, that material that's being used, you know, the recycled material that's being used to produce more aluminum cans is a lot more energy efficient than if you were to go and mine, you know, all the materials that you need to make a can out of virgin materials. In fact, they say it uses, aluminum's a good example because it uses about three quarters less energy. Wow. Um, and, that, and the thing too we're hoping is, you know, people are recycling, obviously our recycling rate is very high, but as people start to make these connections and realize that recycling is not just about waste and landfills, but it's about climate change, we're hoping that is an added value proposition mm -hmm. that helps mm -hmm. us meet, uh, you know, the city actually has a zero waste goal. Um, so we, we want to get to Fabulous. a point, yeah, where we're just not producing waste. Um, zero waste by what year was it? Zero, uh, well, it's, it's 75% by... Uh, 2010. Yeah. And zero waste, I don't know that there's a, a set I think that's, I, that's that. exciting because that's yeah. what the natural world does. There is no such thing as waste mm -hmm. in the natural world. Correct. And Being if our used. cities were, were in our towns and in our homes were working that way, yeah. we, would be, we would be, the waste turns into something you use somewhere. Right. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of local benefits. Just on the energy side, we did a, a program using $8 million of state funding and we retrofitted the lighting systems in 4,000 small businesses saving those businesses three and a half million dollars a year in their combined electric costs. So at eight million dollars expenditure to save three and a half million a year. It's a very good this investment. Is a, an, yeah. Excellent investment like for the mm -hmm. state money. I, if I could get that on my mutual fund, I would be ecstatic. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I might quit so our work. So biggest, our biggest savings in your plan, because we have about four minutes left here, I want to make sure there's like, we, we cover everything that you wanted to cover. Mm -hmm. You're talking about um, trying to do plans, what do you want, in addition to what the city can do directly for the city fleets, how are you working with getting businesses and organizations, I mean, what are you, what are you doing to help promote this awareness across the board? Well, one can you do? exciting thing that we just started is something called the Business Council on Climate Change, the BC3, which um, city and county of San Francisco has teamed with the Bay Area Council, which is a local business forum, to actually establish a forum for local businesses to work specifically on climate change. And there's, there's no other group like that right now in San Francisco. And, you know, climate change is not going away and businesses are, you know, a lot of them are ahead of the curve on this stuff. So if we can bring them together and get them to talk to each other and get them excited about solutions and give them better access to the city services, then, you know, that helps us move forward in reaching our target. So that's right. one effort that, that and, we're And this afternoon starting. we're meeting with our small business commission to have a brainstorming session on exactly what can San Francisco's small businesses get how can they get involved and what could we do together? Which is, which is exciting. I realize mm -hmm. that 
if, even if, if you're just reducing, if you're doing your, your composting and your recycling and so on for everybody, I mean, I, where are your neighborhood composting bins that right, everybody can right. put their green, you know, their food waste into exactly. and mm -hmm. so on? Well, and so this is really kind of the final point is our call to arms is to try to get every organization in the city, and it might be a Boy Scout troop or a knitting circle or a dance class or anybody who wants to create a group and create a, an event that we want to partner. We want to have the city partner with them to help them get the word out on their event. Yeah, help mine, them, mine help them, them for good craft ideas. And thinking, because there are, we've got 740,000 citizens, and I'm sure we've got 740,000 good ideas about uh, how to uh, do this. And, and we need everybody to get active. We need every brain available to, uh, to be thinking about this. We're all affected. Mm -hmm. That's I mean, right. everybody's affected with, with both climate change and, and I actually have a question in my last minute or two. In the city of San Francisco, where does your electricity come from? I would imagine that's an important critical issue here. Most of it's climate. imported through the grid mm -hmm. and we do still have one power plant left operating in the city. We were able to shut down the most unreliable one uh, and uh, working with the, our local utility, we, we got that closed down. Uh, but all of the transmission improvements mean that that electricity is coming mostly from uh, around the Bay Area and, and throughout mm -hmm. the state. Mm -hmm. So uh, my job is to cut down the amount we use. And so I, f I focus on the end use. I see. Our, our team focuses mm -hmm. on what people are actually doing in their homes and doing in their businesses rather than what's coming out on the grid. And that's really the, the state level concern is, so what is the grid made up of? And yes. there is a state mm -hmm. uh, portfolio plan that by 2020 or 2012, it'll be 20% uh, renewable. Mm -hmm. And I think right now it's less than 12. Mm -hmm. So uh, they have a ways to go to get to the 2020 point, and it means that it's, there's business out there, business opportunities say, yeah. for, uh, for wind and solar and uh, biogas, biomass. And Tidal. in general, it, we haven't yes. looked at exactly what peak oil is going to mean, but the uh, Governor Schwarzenegger had a task force look at the impact on the statewide economy of, of trying to address climate change. What would the impact be? And the net effect of the study was more jobs and more mm -hmm. uh, business activity in the state, not less. That's, and that's, I mean, that's a big hope for us because businesses can move this, move us into the right direction right. very quickly. Mm -hmm. So we're, the, the city is really hoping that we're gonna have a real clean technology center here in San Francisco. Uh, the mayor and the board of supervisors worked on a clean tech initiative to uh, give uh, payroll tax waivers to businesses that are green. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Keep it up. Right. I'm, you know, go San Francisco. Yeah. I'm proud of you. Thank you for joining me, and uh, I expect to tune in with you in a while and see how's it going. Great. Right. Thank, Thank you, you very much. You're watching Peak Moment, Community Responses for a Changing Energy Future. I'm Jenea Donaldson. Join us next time.